So title for today's message is three more big ideas for spiritual growth. This is a bonus message. Usually you just get one big idea, but there are three in this one. Um, I'm doing a series on how to grow spiritually, and it's one that we're going to pop in and out of throughout the year. So rather than just, just kind of plowing through and doing 17 messages in a row, we'll come back to this at different times during the year. So we're going to take a step forward with kind of three more ideas about growing spiritually, and I'm trying to be super practical. Um, I don't want to, um, I, I don't want this to be like spiritual blah, blah, blah. Like lots of, you know, lofty ideas and, and fancy words. But I'm trying to step back and to say, and really to look at my own life and say, what, what, what has helped you grow spiritually? What's helpful? What, what works? So I'm trying to approach it in that spirit. Since we're jumping back into this topic after having been away, I want to give you a couple of reminders of things we talked about before Christmas. Uh, spiritual maturity is not just getting all your doctrine right. So one way that spiritual maturity is misunderstood is it's like having all the answers and coming up with this like airtight system that can answer every question. Uh, there, there, there's value in trying to answer questions, but you can have something like that and be a very ungodly person. So it's not that. And spiritual maturity is also not like perfect discipline. So another, I think, misunderstanding is if I can just get my act together and get up every morning, 45 minutes early, and read my Bible and pray, and if I'm always in church, and if I always do this, if I always do that, but just keep doing it all the time, that's spiritual maturity. Well, again, there, there's value in, in discipline, but you can do all those things and not be spiritually mature. So what is spiritual maturity? Uh, we talked about a number of things. One is, is mature Christians exhibit a sense of shalom. Shalom is an Old Testament word that carries over to the New Testament some, and it means complete and at peace. But, but spiritually mature, there's just a sense that they are at peace, that the, the, the ups and downs of life doesn't phase them a lot, because they, they've been experienced and they know that God is faithful. So there's that sense of kind of shalom and peace that spiritual, spiritually mature people have. Spiritually mature people exhibit Christian virtues. There, there's a list of Christian virtues in the New Testament, and it includes things like goodness and gentleness and kindness and patience. And, and wouldn't it be great if when people thought of Christians, instead of thinking of uh, lots of rules or political agenda or whatever they, whatever they might think about, wouldn't it be great if the first thing that came to their mind was, man, Christians, they are such gentle people. They are such kind people. and they're so, They are so patient with, with one another and with others. But that's a part of spiritual maturity is that we exhibit those virtues. Another thing we talked about is they're actively seeking to follow the teachings of Jesus. That's what spiritual maturity looks like. I went back over my, my list of marks of spiritual maturity, and I've been thinking about this over the Christmas break, and, and I realized that I, I, I missed one. There was one that I left out that I think is important, and I think in fairness to you, I, I have to kind of put it on the table for us. And another mark of spiritual maturity is that spiritually mature people sin less. One mark of spiritual maturity is less sin. Uh, sin, let me give you a definition of sin. Uh, sin is, there, there are kind of two shades of meaning in the New Testament. One is missing the mark. So the idea, it's a hunting term actually, and the idea is you're, 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 you're trying to hit a target, you're doing the best you can and you just plain miss. Um, and sometimes our sin is like, we have really good intentions, but we just keep doing things that are hurtful to others or hurtful to us, and we kind of miss, miss the target. There's another word for sin that is more like outright rebellion. It's like, I am just, I am mad at God, I'm going to do things my own way, and it's just, you're not just missing the mark, you are in rebellion against God. That's a, that's a more serious kind of, of sin, I think. Let me read a few verses for you. A lot of, I have a lot of scripture in today's message. Hebrews 10, 26 to 27. This is a scary verse. There, there are some verses in scripture that are really comforting, this is one that is very unsettling. And it says, if we deliberately, I think the word deliberately is important, if we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, 
No sacrifice for sin is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and the raging fire that will consume enemies of God. Um, so the idea, it's, it's, a, it's, it's important for us to know this, but if, if we just insist on deliberately, do, deliberately doing our things our way and continue in a pattern of sin without feeling guilty about it and without trying to change it, uh, there's a sense that we may not have our sins forgiven. We may not truly have experienced faith in Christ. Uh, so that's a scary, kind of a scary thought. Let me read another verse from Hebrews 9, 27. This is a good news, uh, bad news verse. Um, and it starts, the, uh, the author gets the bad news out there first. It says, just as people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment. That's the bad news. And when we, we there, there's so many things that are fun to talk about when you're a pastor. Um, but it's important that we not skip over the things that we are uncomfortable talking about. And one of the uncomfortable things is throughout the New Testament, this idea of some sort of judgment keeps coming up. And uh, there's some mystery surrounding it. We don't know exactly what it's going to be like. But there is some sense of accountability for, for how we have lived our lives then, that we need to be aware of. That's kind of the bad news. Here's the good news. And this is, I'm just continuing right on in the verse. Um, I'll, I'll, matter of fact, I'm going to back up and read it all together. Just as people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment, so Christ was also sacrificed once to take away the sins of many, and he's going to appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting on him. So, so we don't need to be afraid of God's judgment because Christ came once to bear our judgment for us, to bear our sins. He's going to come again, not bringing more judgment, but bringing deliverance. There's good news and bad news, but there is a sense that we need to be accountable for working to sin uh, less. Another verse in Romans 6.1 gets at this idea that, that some people, because God is so gracious, might be prone to take advantage of that grace. In other words, if, if God is so forgiving, I'm just going to do whatever I want because I know he's going to forgive me again. Now, in all honesty to you, I have been a Christian for a long time. I've never really ran into anyone who I think has overtly said anything like that. Um, but there is a sense that maybe we could, could, could be lulled into a sense, well, God is gracious so I'm just going to keep on doing this thing that is harmful and that is hurtful. Um, Romans 6, 1 says, What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin so that we can live. How can we live in it any longer? Um, another way of saying that mature Christians sin less would be to say that, that spiritually mature people become holy, become more holy. And the word holy or holiness um, means um, being set apart and different from the world. And this is such an important concept. It occurs 76 times in the, in the New Testament, there's this some reference to being holy. And it's, it's an important idea. We're supposed to be set apart and different from the world. Romans 12, 2 says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what's good and acceptable and perfect. Now the word, let me, I'm going to um, give you a little bit of, of word history. Um, in the New Testament, when the, when the word world occurs, it, it applies a number of different ways. Sometimes it just means the earth. And sometimes it's used to kind of refer to everyone in the earth. Um, but it's often used to, to refer to a, a, a system that is, a po that is opposed to God. But the, when, sometimes Paul particularly would use the word world or worldliness to refer to a, a, a system of living um, or being where you are just opposed to all of the good things of God. You're being, being worldly. Now, I grew up in a tradition where we heard lots about worldly, worldliness. I, we call 12, Romans 12 to the, the wonder verse because pastors could apply it to anything they didn't like. So if there was anything they didn't like, they'd call it worldly, and we were supposed to, to avoid it. And um, uh, I was thinking, again, I grew up in religious uh, fun, fundamentalism 
where worldly meant anything stylish or fun was kind of what, what worldly meant. Uh, that included longer hair for guys, women wearing slacks, going to the movies, playing euchre. And there was one really, really weird one, and that was holding the microphone was considered world. If you were singing, godly people would leave the microphone on a stand. Worldly people, they would look like people like on The Late Show, they would hold the microphone. Now that is really, really weird, and I'm not going to go any further with that. Um, but, but, but those were all examples of worldliness. I remember one time I was out with a group of my friends, a few of my other fundamentalist buddies, and we, we ran into some other high school students who didn't know us. And we, we, we had our fundamentalist haircuts going and our fundamentalist dress, and they were at, and they asked, so we were, we were trying to get acquainted with this other group of people, and they said, why is your hair so short? Because this is the 70s, right? No one had short hair in, in the 70s. Um, so we did what all good fundamentalist kids do, we lied. We told them we were in the military. So um, that's, that's the world I grew up in, and that has nothing to do with, with what this idea of worldliness is. Um, but here's, here's what is the deal, and that is that we, um, we are to be different. There is a sense that people who are following Christ should be distinctly different from the general world uh, around us. Um, but the difference, it should always be in Christ-likeness. We are different because we are more concerned with trying to follow the teachings of Jesus. We're different, not because our hair is weird or we dress funny or we don't do uh, things like play cards. We're different because we forgive people. We're, we're different because we are moved by the needs of people we don't know and will never meet. That's the kind of difference from, from the world that we ought to exhibit. It's a part of what, what holiness is. Uh, Leviticus 19.2 says, uh, speak to all the congregation of the people of Israel and say to them, you shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. 2 Corinthians 7, 1 says, having therefore uh, all of these promises, dearly beloved, let's cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So holiness is a, another, another definition I'll give you is the word sanctification, and I'm, I'm putting this out there not just to teach you fancy words, but it, it comes up in one of the verses that we're going to look at here in a moment. Um, sanctification is the process by which, by which Christians sin less and become more like Jesus. When we talk about holiness, it doesn't happen all at once. It happens over a long period of time. It, it, we, we gradually sin less and become more like Jesus. And this all sets up the next big idea, which is super important, and that is that the Holy Spirit guides us to spiritual maturity. We don't sanctify ourselves. Uh, we can't. But, but san like salvation, sanctification is a gift of the Holy Spirit. God gives us this gift. And I was actually, I, was, um, I had a different kind of sermon outline on this topic for a while. And one of my points was to grow spiritual, you have to dance with the Holy Spirit. Um, and, and to me, the, the dance metaphor was a, a good one. Um, because one word for the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is right by our side. One of the words for the Holy Spirit is, is uh, parakletos. Para means right by my side. Uh, Latos means calling out. So the Holy Spirit is right by our side calling out for us and advocating. It's, the, it's actually the word for lawyer. So if you like watching Law and Order, uh, we like watching Law and Order reruns, you always see the lawyer sitting there right next to their client and speaking on their behalf. That's what the Holy Spirit does for us in this sanctification uh, process. In 1 Peter 1, 2, the Apostle Peter is talking to a group of Christians who had been driven out of Jerusalem by persecution, and he says, You have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood. That is one of the, by the way, that's one of the best verses there is on the Trinity. You see all three aspects of the Trinity in that one verse. The Father has chosen us for salvation. The Holy Spirit is working in our lives to set us apart. And Jesus has taken care of our sins uh, through shedding his blood on the cross on our, on our behalf. Romans 8, 9 says, The Spirit of God dwells in you. 
So when we, we think about this idea of, of sinning less as a part of spiritual maturity, one thing that helps with this is the Holy Spirit actually takes up residence in us. And it's called a guarantee that God is going to finish what he has started. But when we put our trust in Jesus, God doesn't just relate to us from afar. The scripture teaches God takes up residence in, in our lives. His spirit lives inside of us and does a number of things for us. I'm going to list just a, a few of them. Um, Ephesians 3, 16 says, I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. So the Holy Spirit strengthens us. Uh, the Holy Spirit advocates for us. Uh, let me read another verse there, John 14. If you love me and keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, he will send another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The Holy Spirit helps us and is with us forever. The Holy Spirit leads us. Romans 8, 14 says, For those who are led by the Spirit are the children of God. There's another verse in Galatians where, um, that, that goes with this idea of the Holy Spirit leading us, and it says, uh, Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. So, so our job is to kind of keep in step with the Spirit. Now, if you watch me, if you come Saturday night, which you ought to, um, and you watch me dancing, what you will see is I will be working very hard to look at the person in front of me and to do whatever they are doing. Now, where this backfires is sometimes everyone turns around, and then you are in the front. Which is, but if you watch me, it is like a very awkward thing. It, looks, it doesn't look like dancing, but I'm trying to like rigidly do whatever the person in front of me is doing. That's kind of the word that's used here in following the Spirit. Is the Holy Spirit leads us, and we are trying to keep in step with, with the Spirit. The Holy Spirit teaches us. Um, the, in John 14, 25, the Holy Spirit will teach us all things. And here's the coolest thing of all. Uh, what the Holy Spirit does is he makes us more and more like Jesus. 2 Corinthians 3, 18, And we all, with unveiled faces, contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory that comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So mature Christians sin less. We don't do this on our own. The Holy Spirit helps this to take place in all kinds of ways. Um, so those, those are the first two big ideas. Now I'm going to give a, a third big idea that is not really directly, this is kind of a random list of big ideas. It doesn't flow right out of the first two. But I think this is one of the most important points about growing spiritually. I think it's one of the most practical points, and I think it gets right to the heart of the matter of how spiritual growth really happens. Spiritual growth takes place in the context of Christian community. It just happens when we are with each other. We need each other in order to grow spiritually. Uh, the New Testament culture, Megan referred to the fact that uh, we are a very individualistic culture. It was not that way in, in the first century when the New Testament was written. It was a very communal culture where Christians shared all that they had with one another and they ate meals together and they spent a lot of time in each other's homes and they did a lot with, with, with one another. Um, but, but it's so important to have um, relationships with people who help us grow spiritually. And sometimes it's a person who is a little bit ahead of us spiritually. Maybe, it, maybe we intentionally build a friendship who seems more mature with the idea that we can kind of follow them and, and learn from them. And sometimes it's with someone who's kind of at about the same place, but, but there's an intent to help one another. I remember a long time ago, uh, one of my lifelong best friends, Bob Kinney, um, came to me, we were uh, at a different church, uh, I was his Sunday school teacher, and Bob came up to me and said, I, I work in a context where I'm never with Christians, would you just, could we have breakfast together and, and build a friendship? And we had, uh, we had never really talked to one another much before that. I, did, I mean, we were just kind of vaguely acquainted in the class, and he went on to become one of my dearest lifelong friends. And when I am struggling spiritually, Bob is one of the people that I, that I call. I've mentioned another guy who watches our services named Keith. 
college buddy of mine, same kind of thing. All my life, Keith has built into me spiritually and helps me grow. I can't think of anything that is more practical and more important in growing spiritually in that it will be shaped by the people around you. You need to have these relationships and be intentional. If you don't have them, you need to be intentional about building them. Um, th there's this one another concept in the New Testament. Matter of fact, the word one another occurs a hundred times in the New Testament. So I went through and I, I read all of them this week and I put them in the category. Here's some of the things where the word one another comes. Number one, we're to love one another. That, that occurs 16 times. We're to greet one another, build each other up, admonish one another, serve one another, be truthful with one another. We're to sing and worship with one another. We're to pray for one another. We're to bear one another's burdens. We're to encourage one another to be doing good deeds. We're to fellowship with one another. And the list goes on. But, but if you want to grow spiritually, intentionally build friendships that, that, will, that will help you do that. I want to close by, by just... Again, get, getting very, very uh, practical with you. Um, we can't grow spiritually without intentionally setting aside time to be with and encounter. I'm, gonna, I'm focused on two things. One, set us, setting aside time to be with and encounter God and having these friendships. I'm going to talk about them in a real practical way as we close. Um, I am a type A person who likes getting things done. Reflecting and slowing down is not my strong suit. But I die spiritually if I don't force myself to slow down and to just sit in God's presence. And I'm really working on this as your pastor. I want to finish out my last decade of... <clears throat> of pastoring by having a really authentic relationship with Christ. I don't want to just go through the motions. And in order to do that, I'm having to change the way that I live. And it's hard. But I, I've changed my schedule. I put an office in at home so I can do a little bit more work from home. That allows me to get up in the morning and spend some time just sitting with God. There's a kind of prayer um, called a centering prayer. Where really all that you do is think about the fact that you are with God and he loves you. You don't give him a list of things you need. You're not asking him for lots of things. You're not making a list of things to intentionally like praise. You're just sitting and, and thinking, God is here with me and he loves me. Just think of that and, and roll that over. I, I actually set my timer sometimes um, to, 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 I'll set a certain amount of time um, to, to just try to sit quietly without thinking about other things and, and just do that. And then I, then I will start reading scripture and I, I, I'll take a short passage of scripture and the first time through, I will write it down. Uh, second time through, I will meditate on it, and I'll think about what that passage means to me, like one verse at a time or one word at a time. And then the third time through, I actually use the Scripture to write out a prayer, and I write a prayer based on the, on the passage. And we're actually going to come back, I'm going to talk about this practice later in the series, and I'm going to have you all come back on a Sunday night, and we're actually going to practice this. And, and, and show you how that, how that works. But you have to have that. And then the other thing is you, you have to have uh, these spiritual relationships. Um, here are some marks of a spiritual friendship. Um, one is it's a relationship where you agree to help one another grow spiritually. So there's kind of a conscious level at which you acknowledge we both need to grow spiritually. Let's help each other. Um, and sometimes you actually say that and might sit down and have a conversation. Sometimes it's just an understanding that you come to as you kind of go through life and you talk about things, you talk about some spiritual things. But there's an intentional desire to help you. you, you you've got to, you all need to have relationships like this. Second, it needs to be a friendship where you can be honest about your struggles. Honesty, it, it needs to be a friendship where you can take, like, take your mask off and like really be honest about what's going on in your life. Um, it needs to be a friendship where you can pray together. If you don't have a friend who you can sit down with and, and pray, you are missing out on a lot. 
And it's one of the most powerful tools to grow spiritually is having someone who you can sit down with and, and pray with. And some people are really uncomfortable with this, and I, and I get that. I think, I, I think guys in particular um, have a hard time maybe with that, um, the vulnerability that comes from that. Um, but man, have someone that you can do that with, and that will help, that will bless you spiritually. And the last thing is it needs to be a relationship where you just enjoy one another. It's not a, a drudgery of a whole bunch of hard things to do. Just do life together and enjoy each other um, and, and have those friendships. Um, if, you are, if you say, hey, man, I would like to have a friendship like that, but it's hard for me to, to connect with people, we have a new small group that's starting up this Tuesday. Talk to Elena or to Colin and Dara. Um, if there's enough interest, we, maybe start, we'll make, we might start a couple of them. Um, but that is a great context to start building some of those. It's not quite as awkward as just one-on-one -on -one approaching someone. You can just join a group and it can kind of happen naturally. Um, but, but those are a few kind of practical thoughts for growing spiritually that I wanted to share with you this morning. Let me say a word of prayer as the praise band uh, comes up and gets ready to lead us in worship again. Uh, Father, we want to become more and more like Jesus. We want to work with the Holy Spirit. Father, give us victory over sin in our lives. Um, help us to sin less. Uh, Help us to become more like Christ. Uh, Father, help us to, to move with the leading of the Holy Spirit. Father, give us spiritual ears to kind of hear your Spirit. When your Spirit nudges us, give us the, the uh, uh, Lord, just the freedom to move with your Spirit. And Father, I, I pray that you would draw us into relationships where we help each other become more like Christ. Lord, the, let this be a church... Uh, not only that welcomes people who are hurting, but let's be a church where no one is lonely, um, but where everyone has an opportunity to build connections with someone who will help them along spiritually. And we ask this in Christ's name. Let's keep that in our prayers. Let me close in prayer for us. Father, um, it's been good to be together. Keep us safe as we go home. Father, we lift up our good friend Larry Chrysler and pray for his uh, complete recovery. <clears throat> Lord, give him strength and uh, just, just lift both he and Judy up to you. Father, I pray for this new group that's starting on Tuesday and ask that you're, you would use this group to develop the kind of friendships that help us grow spiritually. Um, Lord, I thank you for Karen Riley and for Marvin, all that they mean to our church. And Lord, just this opportunity to, to celebrate her 80th birthday and just, Lord, a, a life of faithfulness. And uh, Lord, even, even to celebrate... Um, Lord, just the joy that exists in the, the refit pro program that she has put together, and just to have fun together. Just thank you for them, and pray for your blessing on that. And Father, I pray for this family that, that uh, none of us know, except for Megan, who need a car, and will, will need other things just to get by. Lord, help us as a church to do something uh, that's beyond our expectations in responding to this need. And I, we have no idea how this could come to pass but we pray that you would do it for the glory of your name, and we ask this in Christ's name.